Good morning. If you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Thank you for joining us. If you're visiting with us, if you're online, thanks, just thanks for gathering with us around the Word so that we can fellowship as believers, so that we can worship together, we can bear burdens together, we can hear about what God's doing, like what he's doing in Hillary's life. And so thank you for being here. I want to read our text, verses 1 through 11 of Matthew 4, the temptation in the wilderness, and then we'll begin. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the surety of it, the truthfulness of it. And we ask this morning that you would help us to see Christ in it, that our hearts would be encouraged, that we would be built up in him in new and fresh ways, that you would remind us of things we know, that you would convict us of new things, that we might walk in a greater dependence upon your spirit, that we might walk in a, in a greater holiness, in a way, in a manner that's worthy of this great gospel. God, for those who don't know Christ this morning, I pray that you would open eyes to the great need of Christ, a desperate need to be saved, to be forgiven, and that you would draw them to yourself and give them faith. God, we pray this morning, most of all, that Christ would be glorified as we enter into your word to study it, to know it, and most of all, to behold our beautiful Savior in it. God, help us to do this in Christ's name. Amen. To be a Christian of any maturity for any amount of time is to necessarily hate sin. There is no salvation for those who love sin and remain in sin. Sin, therefore, is a key issue in the Christian life. It's not the ultimate issue, but it is a key issue. There is no gospel without the reality of sin being dealt with. <clears throat> Sin has ruined our relationship with God. It has plummeted humanity into the darkness and the despair and the hopelessness that we see all around us. Sin is what keeps us from God. And therefore, addressing sin is the pivotal event in reconciling us back to God. Because it was because of sin that Jesus suffered and died. He was crucified because of sin. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for sin, to bring us to God. And so it's two simple questions generally, I think, reveal where a person is in relationship to God. Have you been, the first is this, have you been forgiven of your sins by looking to Christ? And second then, are you fighting sin by looking to Christ? And, and, and gospel assurance is rooted in these two realities. To fight sin then is our high calling after we come to Christ, to live holy lives, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, not to gain salvation, but because we have it in Christ. In our text, we have the privilege 
this morning to watch Christ fight sin. He's both the sin fighter leading up to the cross, and there at the cross, he is the great sin conqueror. Where he broke the penalty and the power of sin, the first qualifies him for the second. His sin fighting or his righteousness is what enables him to go to the cross and die for our sins, to secure our forgiveness. It is his perfect fulfillment of the law that qualifies him as the sinless, spotless lamb. Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He had to be made like us, like a man, but in some sense, he had to be very much unlike us in that he was sinless where we are full of sin. Our text this morning in Matthew 4 places Jesus in the throes of temptation. In a wilderness context, in an agonizing physical condition of extreme hunger, face to face with a terrible, God-hating foe, the devil himself. And what happens in this encounter means everything. Is he the anointed one? Is he the son of God? Not if he sins. If Jesus sins in the wilderness, we lose the cross. Slip up here, and the cross is not an option. My goal this morning is for us to consider this text from two vantage points, vantage points, to look at it through two different lenses. And this is really important, the way that we behold this text. The first lens is completely passive, in which we enter the stadium, if you will, and we take our seat, and we simply watch as redemptive history unfolds, as the sinless Son of God is tested. Before we do anything with this text practically, we must first do nothing with it and simply look by faith at the Christ whose sacrifice at the cross was acceptable because he really was sinless and spotless. The second lens is to get up from our seats, in a sense, and head down onto the field and take notes as Jesus hosts a clinic on how to fight sin. His temptations are specific to him as the Son of God. Our temptations are different in some sense, but there's still so much to learn from his perfect example of resisting temptation. I loved those moments growing up when my dad was working on something and he'd invite me in. Hey, come here, grab this, work on this. You do it now, you do it. That's the second lens that we'll look through this text. Matthew begins his gospel with the genealogy and birth of Christ, and then the announcement of Christ by John the Baptist, then the baptism of Jesus, which leads right into our context this morning. His baptism was the anointing of Christ by the Holy Spirit for the ministry to which the Father had called him, to go in the power of the Spirit as the man of the Spirit into the world and accomplish all his Father's will concerning redemption. And in that baptism event, with the triune God uniquely present, each person of the Trinity, the Father makes this incredible statement about the Son. He says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So three important realities come out of this statement by God the Father, which will have great importance for our text. The first is this. This is an exclusive statement. All other sons in the Old Testament, we're not the son in whom God was well pleased. In the Old Testament, Adam is portrayed as a son by virtue of him, of God creating him in his image and likeness. Genesis 3, 1 through 3 unfolds that imagery. But when he was tested as son, he failed. He was tested in the abundance of a perfect garden context, not a wilderness. And he failed miserably. This son was not like his father though he was designed to be like his father. The nation of Israel is also portrayed as a son, corporately, in the Old Testament. Listen to Exodus 4.22. The Lord says to Moses, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. 
But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. But Israel also failed as son. In the midst of great blessing and great promise and miraculous deliverance, they turn to idolatry and grumbling, and the cycle of Israel is not the perfection of sonship. And so God sends them into the wilderness to wander for 40 years. And the text that Sean just read, I'm going to just read a part of it again. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Our context this morning is 40 days of wilderness testing of Christ to know what was in his heart. What is this son like? Secondly, the statement that the father makes of the son is a very revealing statement. It's an identifying statement. This is the son. Prophecy fulfilled. Messiah identified. Here he is. The spirit descending and the voice from heaven testifying. This is the savior who was born in Bethlehem. And he's now being revealed as his ministry begins. And thirdly, This is a relational statement that the father makes of the son. The father says definitively, I love him. This is my beloved son, my dear son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I delight. The beauty of the incarnation is not just that the father sent Jesus into the world and that Jesus came. It is the relational oneness that was the cost of his coming and the cost of his dying. The glory of this love that the Father's affirming. This eternal, uninterrupted relationship between Father and Son. And so from the heights of the Father's declaration, Matthew moves immediately into verse 1 of chapter 4. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark 1.12 says of the same context, he says, Immediately the Son impelled him to go out into the wilderness Meaning there was a certainty to this event. He was driven or or cast out into the wilderness by divine decisiveness. I love him, now test him. Prove him. It's a clear setup. It's a designed test. But not, not with evil motives. It's a setup born out of redemptive purposes decreed by God to reveal Christ to us in his fullness. And all of it is for our encouragement and our hope this morning. Did the father know the outcome of the testing? Of course he did. There was no question who the son was in the father's mind. So why the testing? For us. For us. For for all the spiritual realities. for, For angels and demons to behold. What kind of Christ is this? To see him. And know him in the wilderness to glory in his victory over temptation. This 40-day fast and the temptations are recorded for us. So that we could see firsthand the righteous Christ who died for our sin. So we'd have great hope in the gospel. This one died for our sin. And so so that we would have great hope in fighting sin. I want us to first notice the setting in which the father would test the son. First, it's a wilderness setting. Deuteronomy 8 continues, speaking of the wilderness that Israel was in. In verse 15, he says, He led you through the great and terrible wilderness, with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground, where there was no water. God chose that Jesus would fight sin in a hard place like where Israel was tested, a hard, desolate, lonely, uncomfortable place, so that his obedience would not be propped up by comfort and by ease. The wilderness is a vacant place. There's an emptiness to it. And in it, it reveals who we really are. Where will God take you to learn how to fight sin? He will take you into the wilderness. Some of you are there right now. He will take you into the wilderness because God is not messing around with elegance and comfort. He gets right to the point in the wilderness. As he takes us through extreme, difficult times. 
to refine our faith, to affirm his love for us. Like Christ, he will take you into the hard place, a place maybe we never imagined to teach us glorious truth about himself, like we just heard from Hillary. Second, the setting of this conflict was after 40 days of fasting. There are several references in the Old Testament to 40 days. Moses fasted on Sinai for 40 days before receiving the law in Deuteronomy 9. Elijah fasted for 40 days on a journey to Mount Horeb in 1 Kings 19. And the fasting of Christ may have reference to all of these, but I think most clearly it is a reference to the 40 years of wilderness wandering and testing of the nation of Israel. Both because Jesus quotes directly from Deuteronomy 6 and 8 in his responses to Satan's temptation, and because typologically he's being tested like Israel was being tested, as a son. Jesus is the son that Israel was not, that Adam was not. And he was tested like they were. And he was victorious. I researched the physiological effects of fasting for this long. Luke 4 says Jesus didn't eat any food, so we can assume he drank water. It was a food fast. 40 days of fasting is a long time. My initial research, according to my empirical data with my three teenage boys, is that at approximately 40 minutes, (laughs) not 40 days, Severe psychological effects occur due to impending starvation. My boys are near death after 40 minutes, and by their own emission, will certainly die if they do not eat immediately. Which only highlights the great discipline and the great difficulty of fasting for 40 days. There's general evidence that around that 40-day mark, severe psychological and physiological effects begin to occur. The cardiovascular system is affected. The gastrointestinal system begins to go haywire. The brain and the central nervous system become compromised. It's difficult to concentrate. It's difficult to sleep. All because the body, without food, becomes food for the body. And it's a finite source of fuel. As the body begins to break down, the body for its own fuel, typically a person will die between 30 and 60 days. That is when the body runs out of its own, its own fuel. And so 40 days is certainly a reference typologically to who Jesus is as the true son in relation to Israel. That's major in this context. But there's also the sense in which God the Father determined to take Jesus to this, Jesus the Son to the very edge of physical life. Test him and make it hard. Make it severe. Make it 40 days long. Compromise him physically to test him spiritually. Fasting is very revealing if you've done it. Hunger exposes us. It reveals our true nature. It reveals our lusts. It reveals our expectations, our frustrations. It tells us what we treasure. Food not only sustains us, it is very much where we hide as humans. We plan for it. We delight in it. We obsess over it. We indulge in it. We rarely eat to live. We more often live to eat. And as I was studying this this week, I kept realizing there was something in my hand that I was eating. (laughs) Fasting strips all that away, and we're left bare. The soul is naked, in a sense, as fasting continues, and we're raw before God. That's where the Father would test the Son. At the extremes of his physical capabilities. There's something fascinating about Matthew and Luke's account regarding his fasting. He definitively says, after the 40 days, then, next, Jesus becomes hungry. Matthew 4, 2. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. What is that? Luke 4, 2. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended... He became hungry. 
and I've wrestled with this for weeks, and I, I don't want to say too much, but I don't want to miss something beautiful in the text. And I think perhaps this actually may be a key to the entire context. The statement of when he became hungry and the silence of what went on for 40 days in the wilderness. I don't think that Jesus was supernaturally sustained some other way for 40 days. That's not not fasting if his body's not depleted. And it's not until the end of the fasting and the temptation that the angels come and they minister to him to restore him physically, it seems. I don't think that the body of Christ was without any sense of hunger until the 40 days was over, that he had no idea what was going on, that he didn't feel an empty stomach, that he wasn't aware of his body during that time. But I think it's worth our consideration to ask the question, what was he doing in the wilderness that could have so overshadowed his hunger that the text would only highlight that hunger at the 40-day mark? Was he just hiking around? Was he building shelters and practicing survival skills to distract himself? What do you do for 40 days alone in the wilderness? The text doesn't say, but other texts do. Listen to Mark 135. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place, same word, wilderness, and was praying there. Luke 5, 16, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. It means a secluded, desolate, unpopulated place. And it's most often translated wilderness. From our context in Matthew 4. Meaning, this is who Jesus was. He was no stranger to the wilderness. This is what he did by choice. The desire to pray to his father drew him into the wilderness. So that ministry was necessary, and it was certainly profitable. But his relational home was with the Father, alone, in communion with him, in the wilderness. Psalm 1611, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Inasmuch as the father declared publicly, audibly, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. I love him. I delight in him. The 40 days of isolation and hunger and then the pressing temptations of the devil was the perfect context for Christ to demonstrate and declare with his life, this is my beloved father in whom I am well pleased. I'm utterly satisfied with him in the wilderness. What does perfect humanity look like at the brink of physical death? With nothing, with absolutely nothing but pain and physical suffering in a wilderness that is hard. It looks like Christ, whose joy was not depleted in any way, though his body was on the edge of death. And though Satan was aggressively pressing in on him to forsake his father, John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That is precisely what he was doing in the wilderness, led by the spirit into that hard place. And so we can and we should rightly assume that once in the wilderness, as in all places, he was delighting in his father. I think more often we pity Jesus in the wilderness Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible to be secluded without food for 40 days. And yet it is specifically in this context that maybe the beauty of Christ is revealed in greater ways than we ever imagined. The 40 days meant something when the temptations came. His body was starving, but his soul was feasting. Jesus was utterly and infinitely blessed there in the wilderness with nothing, when in reality he had everything in relationship with his Father. Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Asaph wrote that, but it's wonderfully Christocentric in the wilderness. 
Only Christ can say this and live this out in its fullness. Test Jesus. Take him to the edge. Squeeze him. And his delight will always be his father. The love of the father was better than food. It was better than a comfortable bed. And so here in the text, at the edge of life, physically weakened, enters the devil himself. I just want to review three very specific temptations. Each one of them is designed to tempt Jesus as the Son of God, as the God-man, away from his Father. To bypass suffering, either immediate suffering or future suffering. And glorify himself apart from his submission and relationship to his Father. And just a reminder, these are not our temptations, but they have immense application to us. The situation is very unique to Christ. But I, I, I wanna, along the way, I want to give us very practical applications regarding the categories and the methods of Satan and the perfect responses of Christ, which very much apply to us. So, so round one, temptation one. Satan is tempting Christ to use his divine power to alleviate his human suffering. Or we could say it this way, use your power for pleasure. And the tempter came, Matthew 4, 3, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The if here is, is very important. In this condition, in the original language, the devil is not questioning the sonship of Christ. The condition assumes an agreement. He's assuming it, and he's tailoring this temptation to his sonship. The idea would be, since you are the Son of God. So that the devil is not questioning that Jesus is the Son of God. He's challenging, what kind of son are you? Your father has led you into this wilderness, and you need food. Use your divine prerogative to alleviate your suffering. Eat! Command that these stones become bread. There's food all around you. You spoke the universe into being. What's a little snack after 40 days? Meet your need with your power. Do it. Jesus' response is drawn from Deuteronomy 8.3. We've read it twice already. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Meaning, physical bread isn't the only issue at play for Christ. It's not the ultimate issue right now. Jesus says, man, as he quotes, referencing both himself and all of us. We're in this. Man is more than simply a physical, pleasure-seeking machine. There's more to eat than bread in this life. And right now, the Father has ordained something else for Christ, a different kind of sustenance for him. But just quoting that, I think, is a profound statement about humanity. Though you and I have many physical needs, and we can experience many physical pleasures in this life, none of us were designed for only that, or exclusively that. We were designed for something so much greater, a greater feast, a greater food, a divine purpose. We were designed to live, he quotes, on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Meaning, you and I have a soul, not just a stomach. We're image bearers. We're designed wonderfully by God and purposely for God. And when we deny that, and when we indulge that and deny him, we live merely to meet our physical needs. We relegate ourselves to a terrible, hopeless lie. Man does not live on bread alone. What a privilege. What a joy to know as, as man, corporately, all of us here, to know that you and I were designed to hear from God. Cognitively, relationally, to actually know him. 
to know his heart and his plan, to know him personally and intimately, so that what we hear from him would matter to us, deep in our souls, and it would be transformative for us, and it would bring us the greatest joy to know him. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Are you lost today, lacking purpose and hopeless at every turn? Could it be that you have given yourself all of the, of the focus of your life on satisfying your immediate temporal comforts and pleasures, indulging them, protecting them? Are you living on bread alone If you are, repent and rejoice because you were made for something so much greater. And look up and look to Christ. God made you to live on him, to feed on him and live in him, to feed on his words so that you could have a relationship with God, having your sins forgiven and be loved by him. There is no greater purpose for you than this. And if you give yourself to the bread of this world, you will forever live in hopelessness. The gospel is for people who are committing the terrible sin of living on bread alone. That's rebellion to God when you were made for something so much higher. Notice the response of Satan with each temptation as Jesus answered, beginning with this one, utter silence. Jesus answers perfectly. He responds righteously. And all Satan can do is move on to the next temptation. There's no follow-up. There's no argument. With each temptation, Jesus ends the matter completely. And so I want to pause here for a moment and give us a little interlude of four ways Jesus fought sin. This is is where we kind of get up out of the stadium and we go down on the field. It's, It's time for the clinic. The first way that Jesus fights sin is he quotes the Bible. He says, it is written, the Son of God, face to face with Satan himself, uses the word of God. It's his word, proving out his perfect sonship. How does a man live? He lives on the words of God. And so we need to fight to understand the word so we can fight with the word. So that our thoughts and and the truths that define us come exclusively from this book. And so labor in it. That's what we do as a church. We labor in the word until it courses through our veins. Until everything about us is biblene, biblical. Until every thought is taken captive to the obedience of Christ. And we have an answer for every temptation. We're not there yet. But that is our our love-motivated goal. John 17, 17. Jesus said, sanctify them, set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. He says, it is written. And in saying that, he highlights the medium that God has chosen. Fighting sin involves an objective source of truth given to us by God. Meaning, since that revelation is written, You and I must, must, must be readers. We have to read. I have great compassion for those of us who are not avid readers. I'm not an avid reader. We'd rather do anything except move our eyes across words on a page. We fall asleep. We daydream. We think about things and realize the chapter went by and I have no idea what it says. If you give me a book or some time in the garage, going to the garage. Here's where we have to adjust. We have to repent. If God in his infinite love and wisdom has chosen to write a book for us, then we in humble submission to his choice of mediums must grow to become avid readers of the text. In some sense, not in every sense, but in some sense, your sin fighting is proportionate to your Bible reading. Instead of I'm not a reader, how about this? Wow, it's hard for me to read. But Christ is worth it. He's worth all of it. 
If Christ, who is my life, has chosen to reveal himself to me in the text, then I will read the text to find him in the text, that my soul might be equipped with the text so that I can battle sin and glorify Christ. The second way Jesus fights sin is he quotes the Old Testament. Now, granted, the New Testament hadn't been written, but stay with me here. Not many people are well-versed in the Old Testament, especially for, I think, this kind of temptation fighting. When I think of the Old Testament growing up in the church, all I can think of is the broccoli of the Bible. It's the vegetables. You know that you need it. Just get it down. And then the New Testament is more the candy or the tasty fruit. I, we, who would rather, you, you got a choice between reading John and reading Numbers. Whew. John. But not for Jesus. In the face of these specific temptation, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. He fights sin with the Old Testament. The point is, the Old Testament is quite sufficient for the task. It's inspired. It's Christ-centered. It's profitable for fighting sin. In the battle against sin, the Bible is a massive armory of weapons. So don't deny yourself the full arsenal because it's difficult to read or because it's harder maybe to understand. Fight to equip yourself with the whole book, cover to cover. Number three, he quotes the Bible succinctly. And forgive me for the obvious, but this was the most encouraging to me, blew my mind. It's not just that Jesus quotes the Bible to answer the devil's attack. It's how he quotes it. This is, this is like sin fighting for dummies. And I'm in the front row of the class going, yes. He quotes it succinctly. Jesus could have said nothing in response. He could have just known the truth in his heart and turned away from sin. He could have simply said out loud, no. And maybe referenced the book of the Bible. He could have given a three-hour lecture on the intricacies of Old Testament prophetic fulfillment and the true nature of divine righteousness. Quoting extensively from all parts of the Old Testament. He could have answered by quoting all of Deuteronomy word for word. But wonderfully, and I think by design, as a man, as, a, as the God-man, he answers with a sentence that should thrill our hearts. He answers with a sentence. No more than 18 English words to the total for his first response and 11 for each of the following. Against Satan himself, just a sentence, just one, one verse, succinct, simple. Doesn't Satan need a little more developed answer? This is big. This is title fight. Shouldn't there be a more developed defense? Obviously not. Jesus quotes one sentence for each temptation. So think of it this way. And it may just be a, a beautiful capacity of the mind. That, that, that's the building block of truth fighting, the sentence. The sword of the spirit has to be readily available, easily wielded. And I think there's something so wonderfully insightful and practical here. Study the Bible deeply. Know the greater context and the grammar. Set it in redemptive history. But when it's time to fight, quote it simply. Quote it succinctly. Recite it to your soul so that you immediately respond in faith. And that's not to despise memorizing entire books of the Bible. There's a beauty to that. What do you think, what do you think of when you hear this statement? A verse a day keeps the devil away. We say this so that our Bible reading and our Christian living don't become cliche or mechanical, so that we trust only in the means. If I just read a verse in isolation, almost like an incantation, Satan will flee. That being said, step back from this context and take in the big picture. It's exactly what's going on. Jesus is quoting a single verse at each temptation of the devil. And what happens at the end? The devil flees. And Jesus stands. So that in some sense, understood rightly, a verse is a powerful weapon against Satan himself. If that verse has our hearts. If that truth about God's character, about the beauty of Christ, if that verse has gripped you, then wield it like a sword. 
James 4, 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What could be more submissive to God than come under his word, than have, have so washed your, over your soul with the word of God that verses just fly. They just come to mind as you fight temptation. That is exactly what Jesus is doing perfectly. He uses the sword of the spirit to resist the devil, and the devil flees. Fourthly, he quotes the Bible precisely. The verse is perfectly suited to answer the lie. Jesus answers so thoughtfully, so specifically to the devil's temptation. This means that we must study the Bible deeply. We must study it specifically so that we can apply it specifically. That's not to despise general biblical truths. Those are great. We should know big redemptive realities. God loves us. Sin is bad. But we ought to dig as deep as possible for the most specific truths to answer specific temptations. Why? Because Satan is being specific. And he must be answered with the specificity of this book. The first temptation was over because Jesus didn't eat. He was in the wilderness by the Father's decision. It was a God-ordained fast. And Satan would have him break the fast on his own terms not God's. And notice that he will not subvert God's design here. Jesus will not end the fast before God ends the fast. And so on to round two. I'll try to hurry. Number two, round two, temptation two, test the relationship. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It's an interesting temptation. Jump and he'll catch you. So first I want us to observe briefly that Satan quotes the Bible. That's weird. Three quick thoughts about that. Satan knows the Bible and it appears he, he knows it well. Second, Satan will use the Bible to tempt you to sin. That's, that's evil. As he did to Christ, he will do to us. And so thirdly, beware of this. It's, it's part of the battle. It does, that doesn't mean, no, the, the question is, does that mean that just because I'm quoting a verse, I may not be safe in applying it to my temptation? That's exactly what we're saying. False teachers are masterful Bible students. That should, not take, that should not shake our confidence in the word. It should encourage us to know the word very well, to use it wisely as we spot the schemes of the devil. The devil quotes from Psalm 91, 11, and 12, a psalm about God's sustaining grace and protection of the one who trusts in him. And, it, and in it, God really does give the angels charge over the righteous to protect them. There's a sense in which Satan quotes this correctly. Jesus is the righteous man that Psalm 91 describes, who trusts the Father more so than any man that has ever lived. But there's two key issues of why Satan is butchering the text. The first is the idea of testing, and the second is the idea of timing. Jesus answers the devil with Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa, is what Deuteronomy reads. Massa refers to Exodus 17 in which God commanded Israel to a certain place in the wilderness where there was no water. And there the people began to grumble. Exodus 17, 2, Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And then verse 7, he named the place Massa and Meribah. It means testing and quarrel. Because of the quarrel, the sons of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? To test God, either by griping about water or by jumping from the pinnacle of the temple, is to ask the question, is God really there? Is he really going to catch me? The motivation to jump to certain death from a high place inherently questions God's presence. It doesn't affirm it. Will you catch me or will you let me die? To jump then negates the confidence and the rest of a loving relationship. 
God doesn't need to be challenged. Testing is not faith. It's doubt. It demands that God acts. It tells him what he must do. To jump is forcing the Father's hand. But notice this. Psalm 91 is wonderfully true, but not by human mandate. It's true by God's mercy according to his providence and the counsel of his will. Because the second issue is timing. Psalm 91 is actually proved out in our, in our context in Matthew 4. But not by Jesus jumping to see if the Father will catch him, but by his humble submission not to jump, but trust and remain where the Father had led him into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting. Look in Matthew 4.11. Then the devil left him. And behold... Angels came and began to minister to him. It's like it's alerting us to the, to the provision of the angelic realm, like 91, Psalm 91 promises. But after the temptation, and as God ordains it, the devil wanted Jesus to jump to prove his love. But the angels do come and help, and they do minister to his needs, but at the right time and in the right setting. Thirdly and finally, temptation number three Bypass the cross for a different kingdom. Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This final temptation isn't, doesn't seem all that tricky. The devil goes all in, in a sense, and finally says, here, this is all I've got. Worship me, and it's yours. It feels like a last-ditch effort to, to distract the son away from the father. And Jesus answers with Deuteronomy 6.13, or Deuteronomy 10.20. And basically, he says, go, depart. That, that's enough. I won't hear this anymore. This, is, this seems offensive to Christ because worship is the high calling of humanity, but not the worship of anyone or anything. Worship is reserved for the one who alone is worthy of worship. And as the God-man, Jesus affirms that God alone, his Father alone is worthy of all worship. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God, a kingdom of righteousness that is accomplished through the death of Christ. And off, the offer here is to bypass the suffering of the cross and take the kingdoms of, of the world. Take curtain number one and you'll, you'll, you'll bypass the suffering of the cross. Satan is tempting Christ with the same thing he's tempting us in this life. Take the stuff and ditch the creator. Live for self, deny God. Find your life in this world, in your pleasures, in the bread of this life. And Jesus is asking us to do exactly the opposite. Listen to Mark 8. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, all the kingdoms, we just see it in Matthew 4, and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul. What could possibly keep Christ from this offer? Skip the cross and take the world. No pain, no pain and all pleasure. One thing makes this utterly disgusting to Christ. The same thing that filled the 40 days of his wilderness wanderings. A different glory not the lies and the glimmer of this world, but something so weighty that you could put the entire glory of all the kingdoms of this world on a platter in front of him and none of it would catch his eye. He's not moved at all. What would keep him back? A perfect love between him and his father, an eternal relationship. Selling out would be unthinkable for the Christ. It would be utter insanity. So that the temptation is real, but the possibility is zero. Listen, Satan in the, in, in the garden, Satan in the wilderness, Satan in your wilderness is a pitiful peddler of lesser things. 
And he sells lies and empty hopes and promises to Christ and to us. And Christ is simply satisfied with his father. He succeeds where all others fail. Sin makes the scene so attractive. And humanity sells out for so, so much less. Have you sold out to gain the world, even a part of it, at the cost of your soul? Jesus is saying, come follow me. You weren't, you weren't made for bread alone. Die to all that, and I'll give you real life, eternal life. Two quick points of application. The first is this. Remain seated in the stands watching Matthew 4. Remain seated there permanently and watch the Son of God fight sin and temptation on his way to the cross. Let that affirm in your heart that the sinless one died on the cross. Stay seated in the stands and just say thank you. And worship the God who sent his son, who learned obedience through his suffering and never sinned. Just sit in the stands and receive it and believe it and never put yourself in the wilderness fighting to prove your own righteousness before God. You and I have no business there because of what Christ did there. And second, finally, with that always in mind, with the sinless Christ who su- 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 sorry, succeeded in the wilderness and succeeded at the cross, watch him and learn from him in how to fight sin the same way. Love for the Father, love for Christ, according to the truth of the word. Having been joined to Christ and fully pardoned, this is now our freedom. He is our freedom. We have the same resources, the spirit and his word. We have a new heart that wants to fight, and so let's fight well having already received salvation. His sin conquering has everything to do with my sin fighting. But we're fighting a defeated enemy and we're not worried about the penalty of sin any longer. But we will and we must fight because he's brought us into a relationship with the triune God and that relationship will always be enough. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the suffering of Christ in the wilderness. Thank you for the victory of Christ, both in the wilderness, in Matthew 4, and at the the cross itself. God, thank you for his sacrifice that secures our redemption once and for all. God, may we rest there. May we grow in our understanding and our love of the gospel that saves us. And then may the fruit of that be a great confidence to now go and fight sin, to fight sin as Christ fought sin, to fight sin in Christ, looking to Christ, led by your spirit. God, help us to fight sin for the glory of Christ because he is our great sin fighter and sin conqueror. Help us to do that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.